Hello, thank you for joining me. I'm excited to talk to you today about New Kingdom intrusive burials at Saqqara, cultural complexity and material and practice. This is a photo from Saqqara, Egypt, which is about 30 kilometers south of Cairo. You can see the step pyramid in the top left and a large mud brick mastaba tomb, number 3507 in the center. Walter B. Emery excavated several of these early dynastic or early third millennium BCE, Mastaba tombs in the 1950s and 1960s. He uncovered a number of later intrusive or secondary burials cut into the earlier Mastabas. Many of these burials had a complex combination of material culture and burial practices traditionally interpreted as signifiers of distinct cultural groups. The burials I'm discussing include material with parallels in the early 18th dynasty and possibly also the late second intermediate period. So we're in the 16th century BCE. The aim of this short presentation is to create wider awareness that these intrusive burials even exist and to give you a sense of the character of the material culture and practices that were used by the local community in these burials. These intrusive burials are heterogeneous in the method of burial and the types of material culture present. The study is in the very early stages, so only preliminary observations are presented on a small selection of burials. To date, only one of the Saqqara intrusive burials has been published in part, with the others remaining mostly unknown. This is the plan of an intact burial published in an article by Janine Borio. She gave the burial a very early 18th dynasty date. David Aston proposed a date as late as Tuthmosis III. I've always been interested in this burial because of the combination of material culture that I will show you, but it wasn't until I read some correspondence between Janine Borio and various curators and researchers that I realized Emory found many additional intrusive burials from this same period. I wanted to learn more about them. So with the support of the FWF START project, Beyond Politics, Material Culture in Second Intermediate Period Egypt and Nubia, and the principal investigator, Dr. Bettina Bader, I visited the Egypt Exploration Society in London to review all of Emery's notebooks, sketches, and photographs from the Saqqara excavations of the 1950s and 60s. I did find additional intrusive burials some with photographs and plans, others noted only as another NK burial. Using the distribution list and a bit of detective work, I found many of the objects are currently held in several UK museums. I was only able to visit the British Museum and Manchester Museum before I had to end my research trip early due to the coronavirus travel restrictions. Hopefully I will be able to continue recording this material in the not too distant future. Using the records in the Egypt Exploration Society archives, I found intrusive burials of this period not only in Mastaba 3507, but also in five other Mastabas. Due to my limited time, I will focus on a few examples of intrusive burials in Mastaba 3507. Emory excavated this first dynasty or early third millennium BCE tomb for the Egypt Exploration Society in late 1955 and early 1956. These photos show the preservation of the mastaba at that time. Let's look at the burial that started this study for me. You saw the plan from Borio at the beginning of the presentation. Here is an unpublished photo of that burial in C2. The body is supine extended with remains of linen wrappings and small fragments of a painted cartonnage mask adhered to the skull. This burial had wood fragments of what was probably a coffin, and you can see the row of bricks on either side of the body from a vaulted superstructure. In his excavation day book, Emery said the body is female, but in an EES booklet, he said the body is male. So the sex is not certain. The majority of the grave goods are clustered near the head. I studied the vessels from this burial that made it to the British Museum, pottery belonging to the Egyptian tradition, 
includes two drop shaped jars. You can see one at the left of the screen. There is a so called flower pot at the top of the screen. This is a bowl with a hole intentionally pierced through the base. We don't know the function of these vessels, unfortunately. There is a beaker, biconical jars, and shallow dishes. Taken together, this corpus fits very well with parallels from early 18th dynasty context. However, we must be careful because this style of pottery does not appear at the same time across Egypt. And there is no sharp dividing line between the material culture of the end of the second intermediate period and the very early 18th dynasty. So we need to be cautious with these dynastic dates. There is also a large amphora that could be Egyptian or Levantine production. From the photo, I think it is likely to be Egyptian, but I can't be certain and I don't know the current location of this amphora. There is an Egyptian alabaster coal pot and three blue finance vessels with black decoration of pendant triangles, lotus blossoms, and waving straight horizontal bands. A Cypriot basin one-ware jug is also present. You'll see that a little later as well as two Nubian or Nubian style beakers. The inclusion of these beakers led Emory to call this a Nubian burial and Borio called it a Kerma burial. We need to take a closer look at these beakers. This is one of those beakers. You can see these are not the fine classic Kerma beakers that spring to mind when you think of Kerma pottery. They are handmade but with thick walls an uneven rim, a rippled exterior surface, and heavy trimming lines on the interior. They are burnished, but nothing like the highly polished classic Kerma beakers. Even the shape and the brown color of the oxidized area is unusual. We cannot assign this to the chaîne operatoire of the classic Kerma tradition. It also does not belong to the Egyptian pre-dynastic tradition. Perhaps it is Kerma Raison, but for now, I'm only calling it Nubian style. Certainly, we should not try to assign an ethnicity to this person based on these two unusual beakers. In my study so far, I have found only two additional beakers from the intrusive burials. One is another unusual Nubian style beaker that differs from the beakers in this burial, but again is not classic Kerma pottery and there is one proper classic Kerma beaker. No other Nubian or Nubian style pottery was found or it was not recorded by Emory. This Cypriot base ring one jug from the burial is an import. The introduction of base ring one wear into Egypt has been dated from the late second intermediate period to Tuthmosis III, that's quite a range, I will not be settling that Cypriot pottery feud today. For this talk, noting its presence is enough. My favorite object from this burial is an Egyptian faience interpretation of an Aegean shape. This is a libation vessel called a riton. This type of conical riton with a vertical handle is not an Egyptian innovation. The shape originated in the Minoan and Mycenaean cultural spheres. This Saqqara riton is the result of Egyptian material and techniques being used to reinterpret an Aegean form. The rows of pendant triangles below the rim and a lotus blossom enveloping the lower body fits very well into the Egyptian repertoire of motifs for faience vessels. This is not the only example of a faience riton. I know of five others found in Egypt and Nubia. There are many more in clay. The pendant triangles found on the Saqqara riton is a common motif on the other examples as well. The faience jewelry from this burial is impressive. There is a necklace of disc beads in the top left photo. The necklace in the top right photo has disc beads ring beads, and melon ball beads. Both types of necklaces will be familiar to anyone working on second intermediate period and 18th dynasty material in Egypt and Nubia. The collar in the bottom right photo is made of long tubular beads with a pendant that I think is a schematic falcon. This one burial has elements of Egyptian, 
Nubian, Cypriot, and Aegean influences in the assemblage. Let's move on to one of the unpublished intrusive burials from Mastaba 3507. This child was buried in the Mastaba in Magazine J, so we have a bit more information about the location here. The body was placed in an undecorated wooden coffin in a contracted position lying on the right side with the head facing south. Outside of the coffin near the head is a drop-shaped jar with a dish lid, an ovoid jar, and a bowl containing food remains. Emery recorded the bowl as having a black painted rim. I can't see a black rim in the photos. However, there are black rim bowls in several other burials and it would not be out of place here. Inside the coffin, a biconical jar was placed at the pelvis and femurs. A small broken jar of unknown type is just below. And then you can see a small faience cylindrical vessel. It had remains of a linen covering tied over the rim a string of faience beads was wrapped around this vessel as well. A dom palm fruit is in front of the feet. Faience beads were found at the neck, both wrists, and both ankles. So far, the only part of this burial assemblage I've been able to locate is the blue faience vessel. I found it thanks to the J9 written by the excavators and recorded in the Manchester Museum database. It's object number nine from Magazine J. In contrast to the first burial we looked at, all of the objects here fit well into Egyptian material culture traditions. There are no imports or obviously non-Egyptian style elements. Before moving on to the next burial, I pulled together a slide of vessels from other intrusive burials to give you a better sense of primarily the pottery corpus because the pottery is what provides most of the chronological information about these burials. I won't go into detail. There are a lot of bowls and jars with black painted rims. This is a well-known feature of the early 18th dynasty across Egypt and possibly the late 17th dynasty at Thebes. I have two biconical jars with white slip and black rims. If you know of parallels for this, I would be very interested and my email will be on the last slide. There are alabaster coal pots, some with a completely carved out interior and others are drilled in the center. The next burial I will talk about was quite a surprise when I saw the photo. This individual was buried on a wooden bed. This was an unexpected find because although bed burials are known in Egypt in the first dynasty, bed burials in the second intermediate period and early 18th dynasty are predominantly associated with Kerma burials in Nubia. This bed is a simple construction of Reisner's so-called Angarib type. There is no footboard, headboard, or bed legs carved in the shape of animal legs. The person is a female in a contracted position on her right side with the head facing west. Thin braids of dark brown hair were still preserved on the skull. Some bed burials in Nubia had the body wrapped in animal skins. Here, the bed and body were covered in five linen sheets. If anyone listening is aware of additional bed burials in Egypt from this period, I would very much appreciate a comment or email from you. Before I take you on a bed burial tangent, let's look at the rest of this burial assemblage. Vessels are clustered near the head and partially underneath the bed. There is a drop-shaped jar, a large bowl with pedestal base, bowls with ring bases, and a faience carinated bowl. A blue glazed scarab was found at the left hand, but unfortunately there is no documentation of any base motif or the back type, so I really can't say more about the scarab at this time. She had a necklace of faience beads. At the lower ribs was a bowl with a coal pot inside. This burial has objects completely at home in the Egyptian repertoire, but the placement of the body in a contracted position on a bed is not a common occurrence in Egypt, but is better situated in Kerma in Nubia. This was not the only bed burial in Mastaba 3507. Multiple entries in Emery's daybook succinctly said another NK bed burial. This is the only other bed burial with a photo. You can see it is the same on Garib type of bed. Only part of the bed and body were still extant in this burial, 
There is a drop shaped jar near the head and partially under the bed. This placement of a drop shaped jar near the top of the head is a common practice among these burials, as you may have noticed. This is also a helpful photo for visualizing exactly how these burials were cut into the mastaba. You can see part of the western facade in the lower left. Although the practice of burying a person on a bed is mostly associated with uh, karma material culture in Nubia, the Angari bed was also a part of Egyptian material culture and found in settlement and tomb context. When it is found in tombs, it is part of the burial equipment and not a resting place for the body. That is an important distinction to make. The Deir el Medina Angari beds in the Eastern Cemetery were recorded as showing traces of use and were probably used before being included in the burial assemblages. The bed from Amarna was not found in situ, but rather dumped in a street in the workman's village. The Angari bed is still used today in Sudan, although the tradition is waning and there are only a small number of craftsmen who still know how to build them. The British Museum's Amara West project and curator Manuela Lehmann worked with a craftsman named Mustafa to build a modern bed based on ancient bed fragments found at Amara West. If you want to know more about that interesting project, please check out their blog. You can find Angari beds in modern Egypt as well. This February, I saw this Angari bed outside on the street on Elefantine Island. It was a lucky find for me. Back to the Saqqara burials. How can we or should we talk about this complexity in material culture and practice? When considering the bed burials, Emory used a cultural historical approach. He said they were probably all or mostly burials of Nubian mercenaries employed by the Egyptians in driving out the Hyksos invaders of the Delta. And about the first burial we discussed, he said, there can then be little doubt that the occupant of this burial belonged to the warlike people of Kush. This makes for an exciting story, but the archeology span cannot support this type of narrative. And thankfully we are finally moving beyond this cultural historical approach in Egyptology slowly. So what is a better approach or lens through which to view this combination of material and practice at Saqqara? The most popular in recent years has been cultural entanglement. Although a cultural entanglement framework is helpful for understanding many interactions and resulting material culture and practice, I do feel it can be overused and misused. Sometimes attaching on the entanglement label to a situation is the end of further investigation and discussion when it should be only the beginning. I don't want to force a paradigm onto these Saqqara burials. I'm still considering what methodology will be the best way to understand what's happening at Saqqara, but for now, I think I can say these burials show us members of a community that actively chose objects that drew from what we consider to be typically Egyptian, Nubian, Cypriot, and Aegean influences. And in terms of placement of, of the body in the burial, they chose practices that we as Egyptologists put into fairly rigid categories of either Egyptian or Nubian. While elements of these burial practices might seem bizarre to us and are certainly not prevalent at other Egyptian sites, the complex combination of material culture and practice was deliberate and desirable to this community. Thank you for listening.